Hello, and welcome to Senior Moment. My name is David Refson. I am your host for the show. Senior Moment is about seniors and for seniors. And um, a number of years ago, uh, a music venue opened in Northampton that was only not only iconic, but sort of international in flavor. Forty years later, it is still going strong. I am very pleased to have as my guest Jordy Harold, along with John Riley, who started it all. Jordy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So one of the things I wanted to start with is, is uh, something that you did back in the 70s before you actually got involved in uh, the Iron Horse, and that was to go to the Troubadour out in London. How did that come about, and how did it sort of influence things to come? Well, there's a direct line from the Troubadour in London, England to the Iron Horse that actually starts before my arriving at the Troubadour. When I was uh, about 11 years old, I went to a summer camp where someone who ended up uh, being a former student of my dad's, who was a high school teacher, taught me to play guitar. And uh, it was also the summer camp was in Beacon, New York, where Pete Seeger lived. And uh, we were told that, well, maybe, you know, just maybe you'd actually get a sighting. Maybe you could play along. And that, that, that part didn't happen. But uh, my dad uh, helped me a little bit with a rudimentary guitar when I got back, and then his friends who were a little bit better than him helped me uh, you know, for another few weeks, and then I exhausted within days what they could tell me and got hooked up with uh, the local teenager who gave me more guitar lessons. And uh, eventually, um, I got past whatever they could all teach me, but my mother's best friend decided that then she would school me by giving me albums. And she lived in Greenwich Village, and she got me Tom Paxton's first album. Maybe it's called Ramblin' Boy, right. uh, which actually does a cameo in, uh, in uh, uh, the recent uh, biopic about uh, uh, Dave Van Ronk's life. Right. And um, so I then became a Paxton fan. I don't know. Probably then, you know, it was the 60s. It was the beginning of, you know, the folk revival, and that was a, that was a hip thing. Yes, it was. And, um, and I proceeded to get all of his albums. And on maybe three albums after that, there was a, a song called Leaving London, in which he exclaims, you know, that uh, he's lovelorn, he's in London, and he goes to the Troubadour, and it's totally packed, and he sings a song that she knew quite well. And quite, quite literally, uh, you know, eight years later, I found myself uh, in London, lovelorn, having uh, had a falling out with my girlfriend, and I went to the Troubadour, and I went down to that same basement, and I sang a song she knew quite well. And uh, during the day, I actually felt at home there. The place kind of fit like a glove, and I would sit and write in my journal, and one of the things that I wrote in my journal was the coffee house fantasy, you know, how I might open a place that felt like that, you know, which had people hanging out by day, but music at night. I mean, you know, Dylan wandered into the Troubadour when he was first in London, and there were instruments all over the walls, such as there are even today, 40 years later, at the Iron Horse, and definitely took a big page from their history. And in fact, I got to go back there uh, just uh, last April in 2018 and visited with my family, and the manager was very nice and took us around. And coming full circle, a waitress at the Iron Horse in the 80s was actually a very fine artist, and when she left, she gave me a copy of an etching that she had given to the troubadour of the actual facade of the troubadour. Wow. And uh, I was able, when I got, when I went there, they said, you know, uh, we remember that artist and we don't know where ours is, you know, so God bless you, you have one. And I decided that I would send them mine wow. to bring it full circle. That's really something. There's a long answer to a short question. I understand. So, so now we're back in, in the United States and it's, uh, the 70s and moving along, and somehow you and John Riley decided on doing this venue, this coffee house fantasy, so to speak. And so you and John decided to open something. Yes. Talk about that initial something that's the beginning of all of this. Well, that, that uh, initial something came because uh, we were, we were, we were, Hanging out, as as you would say, uh, some sometimes uh, over beers here or there, sometimes at his apartment, and kind of bemoaning the fact that there was no place that had that feeling, that had the coffee house feeling, that you could just go and be. And I think it was one night actually in Sheehan's Cafe, and we oh, were in yes. the back room at Sheehan's. 
where it was the only place that it wasn't either the bar or the band that was pressed up against the window. And the furnishings for the back room were a couple of automobile seats and a bare fluorescent light bulb. <laughs> and we looked at each other and we just said, you know, there's just got to be something else. And uh, we, we literally shook on it. And I said, you know, look, the feeling is now, but, you know, if we haven't signed a lease for something within 90 days, I mean, maybe the feeling will pass. Maybe we'll be on to other things, you know. But if, if you were to ask me right now, let's do this. And you did. And we, we did. You know, uh, I think John probably sourced the location on Center Street. And, right. and uh, very quickly we had a lease for a lordly $375 a month. And it was always called the Iron Horse. There was no pre-name to that when you very, very first started. There was no working title. Uh, and, you know, the Iron Horse just kind of got plucked out of the, plucked out of the blue. Uh, my mother was uh, a painter and a sculptor and a metal sculptor. And I was literally at the family home in the Berkshires where her sculptures were uh, planted through the fields. And one was of an Iron Horse. So there was no relationship to baseball players, no relationships to railroad trains, <laughs> uh, just a relationship to that statue that was in front of me. And it uh, became, then it became a logo and uh, a, little, a little bit of a, of a symbol for the place. So, so t 1978 is more or less when it started. Uh, yeah, oh, doors open in 79. The, right. the, th the thought there was the fall of 78, yes. Right, and so who's... Who started coming there? Not not so much the, uh, the the folks to see music, but who were some of the first guests that you had that would be willing to come into a place that was like that and just starting out? Who were you? Well, you know, it was it was interesting because you know, so so what? I mean, at that point, I'm 24, and John's a few years older than me, so I, I don't know exactly what he is. You know, 27, 28 at that time. And you know, all all we knew is that that felt right to us. So then maybe we were thinking, you know. 20 somethings but uh but and we thought yeah maybe a few people you know will come in and eventually the world will grow and we had a kind of a diorama in the front window of what we were going to be about you know and we had a, a chess game set up and a couple of international newspapers and you know a guitar and a sax rakishly posed and maybe a beret hanging on the back of a chair and you know, and a notebook open. You know, I, I, I don't. I have photos of it, but you know, that's essentially essentially what it was. And we thought this will communicate who you know what we want to be to the, to the community. And the very the very first day, we had two hundred and something rings at the register. That's crazy. And the first night. Uh, we were literally scrambling to pull, you know, old milk crates, you know, full cartons of, you know, chocolate syrup, whatever it was that people could sit on, you know, to even get, get people in the door. Uh, so there, there was this kind of pent, pent up need, you know, there certainly were bars in town. There had been, you know, some kind of music venues, uh, you know, in the years prior that I remembered, but there wasn't anything that satisfied that need in in that way, and so we, you know, I'm not to say that every single day was like that in those first days, but we were we were off and running, and and I think it was you know to answer more specifically, you know, I think it was everybody. I think it was students. I think it was you know, I think it was you know, uh, college faculty. I think it was you know, people who were then already you know, uh, approaching being seniors who remembered their you know, bohemian days, you know, in you know, in the you know, the, in, the, in the early 50s, you know, or whatever, you know, so. Just as an aside, uh, I work with a gentleman who's been to the Iron Horse over 200 times. That's the kind of venue that he loved going to, to hear the kind of music that was going on. So there's, a, there's not a lot of just one-offs. Somebody goes there right. once and that was the end of it. Right. And he's maybe an extreme example. But no, but there were, they, he was, but he's not alone. <laughs> right, that's what I'm he's saying. He's not alone, and I can, and I can you know, there, there's one, one guy, you know, and, you know, bless, bless his soul, John Bodnar, who's been to over a thousand shows, you know. And... Uh, Who are some of the early guests? The very, there's a lot of big names, and I've been reading through some of this. There were some serious folks here coming to this venue. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I mean, the, the place was, was certainly in its first handful of years was split between those, those nationally and internationally known names, but it's not what we started out to do. What we really started out to do had much more to do with cafe life and lifestyle than becoming, 
a concert venue for internationally known people. You know, we really just had this vision of like, ah, oh, you know, you'll come in on, you know, we had it, we had it mapped out that on Thursday night there'll be classical chamber music playing, and and on you know Friday night that there would be uh, some form of jazz playing, and on Saturday night there would be you know. Uh, kind of what the original name of CBGB's was, you know, there'd be kind of like, you yeah. know, folk, jazz, bluegrass, and other music from underground, you know. And, and we actually s stuck with that, but what we found, just like the huge influx of people that came in in that first day, uh, by the time we were done with the first week, we had so many local musicians just saying, can I get on that stage, can I get on that stage, can I get on that stage, that we were booked months in advance for seven days a week with people who just wanted to play. And we had a system where people played for tips and you know, we were aggressive, which bothered some people, you know, but of, uh, of collecting tips on behalf of the musicians. We didn't just leave a tip jar on the piano, as it were. Right. And, you know, and everybody left with some money. And in the rarest of nights when the tips were just like, oh, that's too paltry, you know, then we would, we would make up some of the, di the difference, you know, just as, uh, as, 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 as good humans. But, um, you know, so th that, is, that is where it started. And I still see the names of some of those people even last this past weekend, there was a music festival in, in, Mont in Montague where people went from house to house to house, you know, seeing these musicians. And some of those musicians who were playing in those first weeks at the Iron Horse are still playing on front porches in Montague. And, and that was a big part of what we wanted was just that community vibe and that sure. music and that sense of, like, again, slipping into that place at night. And, you know, in those days, a little bit of smoke in the air and the sax solo and a quiet conversation. And we had just had this whole, this whole picture. But um, on another another track, you know, I was friendly with the people who were uh, who had when I was in college uh, a few years earlier who had done the Five College Folk Festival. Right. Of course, that folk festival in part started by you know the likes of Taj Mahal and Buffy St. Marie right. when they were students at, at UMass, and they I had offered them in fact a home in the basement of the Iron Horse, just as you know the troubadour had a <laughs> home in the basement <laughs> of a cafe. You know, right. just replicate when you can. And they were like, no, 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 that's okay. We're doing this. Uh, we've got a series of shows, and we do them in this place, and that's just fine. And they get they would get called all the time for shows that they couldn't they couldn't uh, accommodate because really they were just doing six shows a year, and they were a volunteer organization. And thank you very much. And one day, someone called them and said, you know, oh, we got a few people coming through. Can you do some shows? And then they said no. But then in an offhanded way, it's like, call Jordy. And they did. And they called me. And I knew well enough to say yes the first time. It's kind of like it was my, my, my short career before that was teaching. And I knew that the substitute teachers who got used were the ones who said yes the first time. They when they get called every single time. And so if I said yes the first time, I said, well, I have no idea how I'm going to pay someone $500, which was like five times my rent at the time. Sure. But I better say yes, because then maybe I'll get called every single time. And we did. I wanted to ask you this. Uh, the idea of a, a folk cafe probably changed rather quickly to a much broader musical venue at some point. It didn't, probably didn't take very long to realize that it wasn't just folk music. Well, and as I, as I said even just a moment ago, it yeah. always, even, even on the local level, it started out, you know, classical right. music, folk music, jazz, blues, bluegrass. I was always part of it, and then it, it grew very quickly. The first night's music was Celtic music, and Celtic music became a big part of it. Women's music, as it was called then, became a big part of it, you know, as our, uh, you know, we were uh, aligned with, and then, and then ultimately next door neighbors with the Woman Fire Bookstore, you know, in a true good, you know, 70s, yeah. 80s, you know, culture for the, the valley, and then, you know, international musics of all kinds, you know, quickly followed, you know, Cuban jazz and, you know, touring African bands and, uh, you know, you know ev ev everything, you know, music, you know, you know, French Breton music, you know, <laughs> and then that, that moved, you know, within a handful of years to, you know, what we call the new wave cafe, you know, where people, you know, in, 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 you know, who had been involved, you know, with the Lower East Side new wave scene, you know, were coming through and, and playing. And so, it really, be, it really became a room that had an identity, but it was, it was almost as if it was for everybody. It sure was. I mean, there's no question about that. And then not too long after that, the need to expand occurred, probably in the early 80s, uh, yeah. something like that. Well, the, within, the, within the first even year or so that we were open, we were 65 seats, and right. we conceived to, uh, 
put a balcony at the back of the room that would, you know, maybe up us another 20 people to 85 seats. And so that probably happened by, you know, 80, 81, you know, within a year or two of opening. And then in 1989, you know, the opportunity to rent the space next door, the bookstore had closed right. and it was vacant. And it was another one of those, well, no idea how we're going to pay for this, but let's go for it. And we we knocked down the wall between the two spaces, and then we went for a building permit. <laughs> I like that story. It's always easier to ask forgiveness. <laughs> it always is. You started to talk a little bit about some of the early folks that came on, like Buffy St. Marie, Taj Mahal. Can you talk a little bit about some of the others? People who were not quite having made it yet, but were starting out and was going to make it, or... Well, I mean, in, in there, there were those people in, you know, in just in, if not, I want to say every genre, but in a lot of a lot of genres for us. And I almost don't know where to start for those those with those stories, but just you know, to to tick off a few, you know, in the in the the, the folk or alternative music area, you know, I mean, clearly Suzanne Vega, you yep. know, who sold millions and millions of albums, showed up playing for tips at the Iron Horse. Um, and in fact, I just recently came across and, and sent her a copy of uh, her first hand pen note to me. Sorry I was so short on the phone. I was talking at work, but I look forward to meeting you and playing there, you know, because she still had her, her, her day job. Uh, but, you know, and Sean Colvin started off at the Iron Horse, you know, playing for tips and, you know, and over on the jazz end of things, you know, Wynton Marsalis started out playing literally as a sideman to a sideman. You know, uh, Avery Sharp, who's a wonderful bass player who we're blessed to have live in the area, was in turn the bass player for McCoy Tyner, yep. an extremely well-known pianist. And Avery would, you know, said, you know, would you, maybe I could bring in something of my own. I was like, sure. I was like, so you, can I, does it matter who I have on the bill with me? I was like, no, I'm, what, whatever you're going to bring in is going to be good. You know, I trust you and you've got some connections to the university and think there'd be people there. And he brought in some people that I knew from other bands. And then a drummer who became Winton's drummer forever, Ronnie Barrage mm -hmm. and Winton. And that was his, you know, very special quintet that night for, I think, a ticket of $6. <laughs> uh, and years later, that became Winton, you know, playing literally 10 sets in a row at the Iron Horse to warm up for European tours. And he did that any number of times, you know, and we would thank him for that. And he would say, no, 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 I thank, thank you. This is really a place where it can feel good to, you know, you know, woodshed, you know, and, and uh, rehearse my band. And that, yeah, I mean, all kinds of things. I was just looking sure. at, I was just looking at a calendar. You know, the last time I saw, you know, the alternative band Cake was at the Orpheum in Boston at a, at a $50 ticket. And Cake played a Monday night at the Iron Horse for like God knows how few dollars, you know. Nora Jones played at the Iron Horse for, uh, two sets opening for Livingston Taylor, you know, for two nights for $40 a night, maybe it was $30 a night, wow. as a favor to an agent who wanted to get this person in front of, you know, an audience. And I didn't have the heart to tell him that she'd already played here anyways, you know, <laughs> right. when she was the vocalist for a, right. for a sort of a ambient electronica band, you know, so. I mean, it, it, it's, what's also amazing is that the artists themselves were not one and done. They really liked this venue. This was a wonderful, comfortable place for these musicians to come. And they'd want to come. I know, for example, the Nils. Mm -hmm. They've played there, I, I can't even count how many times. Just for their many, adult lifetime. For, <laughs> pretty much. Yes. But I'm just saying, there's so many other people like that who want to come back. And sure, money was important. And maybe at the beginning with new artists, they had to do what they had to do. But people were coming back, and, and if it wasn't the money, it was the place. Yeah, no, it was, absolutely. It was the atmosphere. It was no, the there were people. In. There would be people who would play, you know, theaters in six major cities and the Iron Horse. You know, it's it's really quite. Something. And some and some of that, you know, I, I'd like to think that a lot of that has to do with uh, how good the audience felt and how good the place felt, and some of that just has to do with, you know, not every night is a Saturday night, and uh, you know, and I was. Uh, you know, I would lie down and walk all over me. I'll give you Monday night. <laughs> That's fine. Just come here. Just, just as an aside, I understand that you actually played a little bit. Maybe a, a little bit. A, a little bit of music. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, well, you know, I played in a rock band in college like everybody else. Right. And I, you know, played at summer camp, you know, even, you know, when I was a summer camp director instead of, you know, said at the time when I was 11 and learning at summer camp. But 
I, I played a, you know, a few, few lead guitar riffs on somebody's demo you know, that then worked out and he got a small recording contract out of it. But I don't think of myself right. as a guitarist. But, it, but you know, having been a guitarist and having played in a college band, you know, even that you know, gives a, a kind of a frame of reference you know, for, what's, for what's, what's going on, where you actually have a set of ears that are not just a fan set of ears, but you know, you, you know some of the terminology and you know what you're listening for. Well, I think you also alluded to it just before, the loyal fan base is just remarkable. This is, again, we talk not one off. I mean, it's remarkable how many people have come back constantly and love the venue and love to see what was going yeah. on. I wanted to talk a little bit about your book. Uh, Jordy has written a book, and it is called Positively Center Street, My 25 Years at the Iron Horse, 1979 to 2004. And I think you have the book with you. Uh, would you mind just reading one particular if you feel okay about that. Oh, I feel okay about it. I'm not sure how much time we have, uh, but... Not a ton, but we have enough time for you to read one part anyway. All right, well... Go for it. Let's see, I think what we're gonna read then, this is, uh, this is just because it was, uh, captures, captures a lot of the feelings. So we're, we're, prob we're probably here sometime in the, uh, the mid-1980s now, so really only five years after the place has opened and there's already been an influx of uh, national and international talent. And one of those areas that, that the club really had a signature in was the blues. And so whether, uh, you know, whether it was uh, you know, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee or whether it was you know, Buddy Guy and Junior Wells uh, you know, or whether it was you know, Albert Collins and Sun Seals you know, from Chicago, uh, there were there were always there were always icons of the blues in in the room and uh, you know and you should pause on that because now if you go to see Buddy Guy you can't see him in a situation of less than four thousand right. people right. you know and uh, so there's the really iconic things happening there. That's you you bring up something really important here. You're right. You can't see Sonny Guy in less than whatever four thousand seats. That's another advantage of the Iron Horse. You were there, you could almost touch these folks. Absolutely. And that really, really made a difference to the people who came in to see the music there. They weren't sitting in the balcony, you know, a hundred rows away. They right. were right there. And that, I think, was pretty interesting. Go ahead, I'm right. sorry. So I'm just gonna kind of jump Go. in, jump into uh, <clears throat> the middle of this. Okay. But this is uh, a little bit thinking about times when uh, Willie Dixon and Albert King, two different, sh two different blues shows of the horse. And I'm going to read it a little bit more quickly than I would otherwise because I see a couple of pages in front of me and I don't want Go to uh, run your clock That's down. That's okay, you're doing fine. Thinking about working with Willie Dixon, I remember being a kid and being like 11 years old and looking on the credits on the Rolling Stones or the Doors songs and seeing that name. Willie Dixon, what did that have to do with those bands? Well, I actually worked with that guy. Just being in the room with him and his huge girth and his gentle nature, the sense of just being in the presence of someone who had written songs that are fundamentally iconic. I grew up as a teen with Spoonful being the epitome of what you would listen to. <laughs> Clapton playing Spoonful, but he didn't write it. <laughs> Willie Dixon wrote it. And there he is, like you said, close enough to touch. His songbook reads like the Bible of the blues. And this guy comes in, and he was just a gentle giant. He was heavy and was walking with a cane, and it was dubious whenever he went down the stairs to the dressing room because they never knew if they were going to get him back up the stairs. <laughs> and his, his hands were enormous. One thing I remember about him was his hands. I have big hands by any standard, and putting my hand in his to shake his hand was like feeling like a little boy. <laughs> there were baseball mitts enveloping my hand. And he had written all these things that just blow you away. He's the Bible of the blues, except he wrote every one of those songs. It's like being with the guy who wrote the Bible instead of hearing someone intone it in Sunday school. You're just like, okay, let me get this straight. Me and 80 or 90 other people in this room are 10 feet away from the Bible of the blues, and he's telling us what he wrote. It's just a most amazing experience. But for all of his having written those standards, he had written a newer song that to him was more important than any of those. Who knows what war we were in, because we're always in a war, but he had a song that said, it don't make sense if you can't make peace. And he had started the Blues Peace Foundation that he was selling buttons for, and he was singing his song to as many people as he could. The gist was, you can be as successful as you want, but if you can't make peace, you're nobody in my book. He was a bass player, and he still played an acoustic stand-up bass long after everyone else was on an electric bass. And he would just 
dwarf it. It was guitar-sized in the presence of his body. You could be really dramatic and say it was like a ukulele, but, but it was dwarfed by his body. He would get to the final lines, it goes, you have mate grade planes that span the skies. You gave the sight to the blind with another man's eyes. You make the deaf man hear and the dumb man speak. But it don't make sense if you can't make peace. And when he sang You Can't Make Peace, he would turn out both of those huge hands that were like four times the size of my hands. And he would hold them out in a gesture of absolute supplication. So those, those are the things I remember about him. Between his physicality and that song, the gesture of supplication, and being there with the person who wrote the book. That was so true in so many shows I did with Robert Hunter. He wrote all the songs for the Grateful Dead's lyric book. That was true of the oft-covered Mose Allison. And that was true of Dan Penn, unknown by name, but who wrote myriad Memphis soul hits. Ever hear of Do Right Woman, Do Right Man? He's the man behind that, what Aretha was singing. Like Willie Dixon, Albert King was a groundbreaking blues man who also played the 85-seat horse several years before he died. Another imposing figure, King was a scorching Mississippi-born southpaw guitarist, and like Dixon, he bridged traditional and modern electric blues. His version of such songs as Born Under a Bad Sign and Crosscut Saw are timeless, and he was a significant influence on the likes of Jimi Hendrix, Eric Clapton, and Stevie Ray Vaughan. Plus, he played a flying V guitar, and you got to love those. <laughs> right. He was well over six feet. It seemed to me like six foot four and, and a kind of 300-pound guy, dark glasses and some kind of hat. I think he smoked a pipe. The band pulled up with their van and a trailer behind it, and he got out, and they're standing around by the curb. I see the band is not coming into the club, and I'm wondering, why is the band not coming in? What's up here? I go out. I don't introduce myself to anybody. I'm just kind of out there. They spot me, and one of them, who turns out to be King himself, asks in the deepest of voices, who is in charge here? <laughs> uh, I try to be. That would be me. And he rumbles, well, then we have to talk. I was like, uh, all right. Do you want to talk here, or you want to talk inside? Let's go inside. So we go inside. And I take this as a small victory because we're inside. That means I'm establishing a precedent. They can walk through the door and, they've come in, and they can come in the club. I'm going through the list in my head. They've been paid their deposit, so they have that. They better not be asking for their money before they play because I won't do that. I'm thinking, he's just kind of going to want to say, you know, my guys are hungry and they have to eat right now or something like that. That's usually the big alarm that's going off. So we get inside and he intones, we better sit down. We walk over to a little table where we'll have some, some of the sold out crowd sitting shortly. We sit at this table, which is comically small for him. He is this huge guy and his knees are up higher than the table. He's got that basso profundo and that little bit of street thing. I'm like, so what's going on here? And he says again in his deep voice, oh, we got problem. We're gonna have to stop here, Jordy, at that moment, okay. I'm afraid to say. Um, we have run out of time. That's okay. And I have a lot more things to talk about, but <laughs> we're not going to get it today. All right. Jody Harold, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. You are absolutely I welcome. Really, thank you so All much. All right.